team cohesion is the big the biggest thing for our program and what we focused on so hard. And I think without without confidence, without level of motivation, you know, which are all second dimension strategies and emphasis, you you, you don't have great team cohesion anyway. Sitting here with my friend, the coach Barry Harrison. Barry's been the football coach for us and friends for a year and a half and um, has done a wonderful job, has a lot of insight on um, leading uh, the person and this generation of athletes. So I'm interested to talk to him. So, Terry, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Cool. Well, um, I don't want your life story, but give our listeners a few reasons why your opinion should matter and why they should listen to you. Well, I've made every mistake. I think every every mistake possible as a coach, um, and hopefully learn from those and trying to get better every day. But no, um, as far as why a person should listen, hopefully, is we we have a staff, um, not just myself, but we really are trying to do things the right way and um, trying to leave a, a legacy well beyond coaching football. And we've had had a little bit of success along the way, both at the high school and the college level. And um, yeah, so we're just just guys that care about kids and are, are trying to build something truly special here at Fringe University. I think your your background's interesting because uh, you waited quite a while to be a head coach. You were a high school assistant for for quite a few years, then a head coach, moved on to college level. Um, I see people being more and more impatient, waiting for their chance to be a head coach, and then getting out of it. Talk me through. Talk to about that process of learning and when you felt like you were ready. And- yeah. Well, I felt like I was ready in college. You know how that goes. So I probably wasn't that different than the people now who want to be a head coach immediately. I just would probably, people had enough wisdom not to hire me uh, when I was 23 years old. But um, but no, yeah, I think it's one of those deals, that, like a lot of people, you feel like you're called to be a head coach. Um, you know, and even teaching this class that I've been doing, I, a lot of kids can tell they're, they're thinking of that from a head coach's perspective. But, you know, one of the things we talk about is wisdom. And the only way to get that is through a little bit of experience, you know? And so anyway, uh, I was fortunate enough at the high school level, worked for three different head coaches at the at the first school I taught at Valley Center High School, and we didn't have a ton of success. And so, you know, I think th- they were great men. I think that really did their best to 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 win there, and we just struggled. We're probably an average team, um, but I think through that I got to learn some lessons the hard way through their experience and and see what head coaching was like on their fa- on their families. And Rob, give me one that kind of specific example of that like what's one thing of hard lessons yeah hard lessons during that time oh yeah i mean one specific example i um uh I, the, the one that comes to mind the most is when it got really hard um i am try without saying names when it got really hard for one of those guys who's an awesome man awesome dude but it, when we struggled he he just slowly started taking away from the assistants and just taking jobs away and now i'm he not only did he coach this but i'm also going to take that and he was it wasn't even in a way that was malicious or um he didn't he didn't hurt feelings along the way but you could just see he he took all that burden on himself and internalized everything i mean it it only got worse it it just made it worse and worse and worse you could see the incoming so it's what he was trying to do was he was trying to take charge of it and just through will alone, try to win. Um, Cause he had been successful before. And by the way, has been very successful after. Um, but I think that's one that that's always really stuck out with me. Um, and then the, and then the other one is just the, um, the, the way that we, when you do lose and, and if you, if your only identity is through winning or losing um, how that can affect just your physical health and just how a guy looks and the, the weight, the invisible weight people carry on their face um was probably the most dramatic examples i've ever heard that invisible weight <laughs> yeah well there you go yeah i mean it's what it's just i don't think there's any other way to describe it but you know how it is there's guys that when you and I pro- i'm probably very guilty of that too at one point in my career but when you lose you could just see it in people's faces and you just you, you just know there's something there so all right we'll go back to kind of your career progression of Long time as an assistant, mm-hmm. get in the head coaching seat, talk about the lessons learned and what you kept pursuing. Yeah, well, th- yeah. So, so, so through that process we just talked about, you know, but I, I, with those guys were coaching, we were struggling. So, of course, 23, 24, 25, 26 year old me was like, I could fix it, you know, um, and thought I was ready to do that. But, but anyway, I got connected to a, to a network of good coaches. Um, and then I ended up going to, to work to be the defensive coordinator for, honestly the best coach I've ever met in my life to this day. He's still the best coach I've ever met. His name is Rick Wheeler at Heights High School. And so I was finally content. I loved every second um, of being an assistant. So I got there in the summer. It was the closest staff I'd ever been on. You know, we, we were just very close group of guys. It was fun. 
he was just respected him and he knew way more about football than me. And I was really just stealing from him daily, all the lessons he had learned through his career. Um, anyway, but I really enjoyed that. And that fall, I mean, I was just happy and content as I've ever been as an assistant coach. And then he, he, uh, he, he told me after the last game of the season at his house that he was going to, he was done being the head coach and I was going to be the new head coach. And there you go. So there you go. It was a really short interview, you know? Um, but yeah, just there at, at Heights high school here in Wichita, hard job. Um, but the cool part was coach Wheeler stayed on as athletic director until our offices right, were right beside each other. So I had him essentially, I mean, I just had my mentor who I was just really trying to model. I was really just doing what I, what he did really in a way, um, or emulate what he was doing right across the hall for me and he was retired and done so there was very little ego and he had a lot invested in the program so he was just a somewhat a sounding board um a mentor all, whatever, all those things that he could be for me and so we were just me and coach Kemp, who's our d coordinator we were just anytime we had problems we asked him so we had a we were leaning on his wisdom and you know i'm sure he just helped us you know circumvent some some issue that we probably would have come come across had he not been there so that was really good won a bunch of games and then you know, through that, I don't necessarily know that we did it the right way. We definitely had a certainly a different coaching style. Um, and that's where at Heights High School, I learned that, you know, happiness doesn't come from winning and you can win and not enjoy it. And that was that was the case there. Well, there's certainly some relationships that have lasted a long time through that through that experience. But it was definitely a case where we were winning. Um, There's probably an element of fear based coaching as opposed and transactional coaching as opposed to a transformational experience. And um, yeah, and so then I, towards the end of that, I just knew I wanted to do something different. Um, I thought that I, I told Coach Wheeler prior to my last fall that it was probably I was going to start looking for places to go and he was about to retire anyway. Um, and I knew I was going to do, do something different. And I thought, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. Maybe I, I just thought I needed to do it somewhere else because it just, I'd been there five or six years. I don't even remember now, but I just thought somewhere new, it would be easier to do something different. And so, so like you did feel like you could change within that same environment. Yeah. I just thought, you know, I don't know, what, I don't know if the, it sounds bad to say the damage had been done, but I just had such a reputation and uh, we had already created a culture that it just seemed like yeah, it would just be, maybe it could have been very powerful change, but it just seemed like starting over would have been the best way to do. It. And and I and I was and I was probably ready anyway. So even outside of my own personal heart, where it was, I think it was you know people just say they just know it's time. Um, and I think I was definitely there. And so anyway, happened to go to church with the the athletic director at Bethel College, and my wife actually taught with they were co teachers at a middle school at B. And so never thought I'd go there. Um, just kind of worked out where I told them help help them find the right coach and. When when met a couple of people and, and met a player there. And that when I met the player there is when it kind of hit me that that's where I wanted to be. And so quite honestly, I only got that job because it was probably the worst job in the country and no one else wanted it. So anyway, went there and we happened to have a little bit of success. And then through that, just connections that that you and I have and 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 people just worked out here. And and friends has kind of been the um, I don't know, it was just it, even when I was a high school coach in Wichita, I was always a school, like, how are they not? competitive nationally there or whatever the perception was as a high school coach. It's always been looked at in the coaching circle of football that, Hey, that could be a great job. And so, you know, a new challenge, uh, taking on a new challenge here was, was what I wanted to do. And yeah, we're excited about it. So you've been through two different college jobs where there was significant change and transformation that needed to happen. Uh, I think you did it successfully both cases and you, you're as good as any coach I've seen of, of creating overall a positive environment and getting buy-in from guys on that. What do you think the key to that is? What does that look like? Yeah, and I know it's a, it's a weird, I think it's, a, that's a very, it's a unique thing because it is, while we've had significant transformation at both places at the college level, um, they've, it's been different puzzles or, you know, and they, and they know two jobs are the same. Um, but I hope at least, and when we talk about it, um, our, our staff talk about what is, I hope, and, and I personally think, and maybe the kids would tell you different, it's just being very genuine about how hard it is to do being very genuine about the struggles that that they're there and just being, you know, as upfront and honest as possible and it, about the hard stuff, um, whatever that might be um, from the, from the zoomed out perspective, institutionally, from the zoomed in perspective on the field that practice on a given day and everything in between being just as genuine upfront about that and telling them, you know, why it matters. Like, why does it matter to be, to, to be a successful student, to be a successful football player, whatever it looks like, because you've heard me joke around, football is kind of silly. And if you can't translate, why does it matter if you take a six inch step versus an eight inch step? Like, because it is silly for a lot of sports to hear, like, why is this coach harping on that? Explaining the why, 
um, and, and connecting that to the bigger picture of why it matters to leave here is it's hopefully a you know a Christian warrior football player or a Christian warrior man. That's that's kind of our big push right now. And so I think when you do that, it is pretty well received and kids kids know you're speaking from the heart. I think I I talked to somebody last oh, a couple of weeks ago about that. Like I read books every now and then. You know, get really motivated about some some book, and I want to be that. I just can't be that guy, and it never lasts. It never lasts over a week, over two weeks, and so in the end, we always come back to just being exactly who we say we are. And when you do that, I think there's an element of trust that you get from kids and families. So uh, a guy I read a lot of is a guy named Tim Elmore, and he does a lot of generational research, leading leading students, and that kind of deal. And he says, this generation, you could lead them if you, you have two things. And I'm curious your thoughts on it. One, you have to know what you're talking about because they can get on their phone and see if you're full of it. And number two, you have to be authentic, which is what I hear you saying. If you aren't those two things, they will just bail on you as fast as possible. Yeah, well, I, I'm probably just got lucky because I wasn't smart enough to not be authentic. Is probably so. There's a whole lot of luck involved, probably in my whole career. But so definitely that. So there you go, that part. And and it's just like when we talk about you know the 3D impact on our program and our institution and athletic department. We talk about first dimensional things, which is strategy, tactics, all these things. If you're not, you have to be an expert at that. You have to be an expert at everything. So. We, we've been very fortunate. We've played to our strengths and we have some systems in place on, on the field. So we're talking strategically now and tactically that we are experts at. And so when, when kids know that and we know how to fix it and we can prove everything we say on film and we try to be very conscious of that, that we don't just say things to say it. We could show them on film that, you know, you hope that gets that, that element of trust. And then, you know, I think there's, we have had, had history of success so we could show them some past success, but now we're in this part. Now we've been here long enough they saw some success, success on the field, but obviously want to grow that. And so now we'll be more leaning on their experience here, hopefully, as far as, you know, uh, success as far as what we're doing strategically. Yeah. What about the authenticity? Because I think in football is unique. It's such a big staff and there's so many guys on the team. Even if you're authentic, if your assistants aren't, it doesn't matter. And you guys have the track record where I think you have the first box check to be you know what you're talking about. I think you guys going to believe that coming in. But the authenticity throughout the staff, um, in cool ways and annoying ways. It's, <laughs> it's pretty unique. Let's harp on the you, annoying ways for this. <laughs> thing, but how, how have you developed that? Because I think that's, that's a big big part of it. Yeah, I, I think, again, I, I don't know if it's luck I or just, you know, you, you maybe there's a feel of what works versus what work, work, work doesn't work. But giving those guys opportunity to be leaders and speak to the team. Um, football is unique because you do have – separate there are teams within a team so i think just the nature of football you have meetings with the offensive line you have meetings with position groups and those are just organic opportunities to be a leader for a certain position coach or gas or, or whatever it is and i think so i do think that helps with football so if other sports i just don't know enough about other sports to know if that's even a thing that happens i think basketball or from my experience of every basketball coach i think they're just always together because it's such a fluid game, you have to be, by the way. Whereas football, there's more of a start and a stop. It, the, the, the nature of positional grouping and practicing makes it a little easier to uh, to do that. So I think you get some of that. I think you're downplaying it, though, because there's a, a healthy respect for you from your staff. But they're very comfortable being themselves around you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not an equal balance. And yeah. they just should get together. Yeah, well, what we're pieces you need. Yeah, I think I think we're friends. Number one, we we're friends before football. Um, we'll be friends long after football, whatever that looks like for every every unique unique, unique person in their own career path. But no, I, I think there's so there's an element of friend. There's an element of trust. I mean, those guys know like we really are who we say we are, and we we have fun together. We all have we've all been through hard times as a player and as a coach before, so we all know that 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 we're tough guys or whatever that means. We handle we handle hard times really well and honestly that's probably the hard times are when we're at our best so, I don't, so that's i don't know we we all kind of crave that and and we all respect each other and so you know we all know you know private we all know that they're a bunch of tough guys that we can all trust and we're all loyal to each other so i think that helps yeah let me shift a little bit talking about the the student athletes that we lead and coach um so i stopped coaching in 2015 and i think there's been a pretty significant shift on expectations of kids uh, that's good and bad. I think they're demanding to be treated with respect, and that's not a bad thing whatsoever, even mm -hmm. though some coaches, it ticks them off. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious your take on how you think this generation of student athlete compared to, let's say, 10 years ago has changed, and how are they the same? 
Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a very interesting. So I think it, the heart, my perspective comes from 10 years ago coaching high school kids and high school kids by nature are going to be different than a college kid. So I've got that different thing going where when I look back to my, my previous coaching a decade ago, it was a high school environment, which is just a little more restrictive and a little bit more structured than now when I think about a college kid. Um, and so as far as change, I, I mean, I can tell you, I don't think the way I coached when I was a first, I know for sure the way I was coaching when I first became a head coach, that would not jive now. It just absolutely would not jive. And I don't know if that's, I mean, I guess I don't know why. It's just that's a way. Right now. What does that, what does that mean? Oh, just, just very fear-based transactional. Um, kids did stuff because they were scared. I was going to embarrass them publicly. And I'd say mean things. I, really, I mean, I'd say mean, hurtful things to kids to try to get them to play football hard. I mean, it was crazy. And so you know, just some, and it was here. I don't even think it came from a bad place for me. It just, I thought if we could just win a championship, state championship, then everyone will know that we're the best. So it was, it was a weird deal. I think kids knew I love them because I would hug them in the weight room and they knew I cared about them. So I don't know that I was that different outside of, we just had this philosophy, but you know, on the football field, everything goes and you can say whatever you want. And I think that's the culture of football to this day, by the way, I don't, I don't think that's changed. And so yeah, I agree. But that I think and I think the excuse and I know the excuse I made as a high school coach at that time was, well, that's how kids talk to each other. And I think it's uh, well, it's like anything. That's the easy way out. Right. So if you're going to fall short of it, if you're if you're not going to be a great leader or if you're or if you're going to lead in a way that probably doesn't create great citizens, great husbands, great fathers, whatever that looks like. I think that's overplay at the high school level because they are younger. But um it's way easier just to say, well, yeah, I can say this or that because that's how they talk to each other. Well, yeah, also, but you're also not affecting any change, which is the role of a coach. Like, And so some of our cultural issues and some of our societal issues, again, can coaches change the world completely? I don't know. But if if we're not going to fight it as leaders of 15 to 18 year olds at the high school level, who's going to do it? And the answer is no one. You know, And so that's the battle I think that every coach fights because it's way easier to submit to well, this is how they speak in the hallway. So I'm just going to do that because they understand that language as opposed to fighting the fight of um, getting those, get them to treat each other better and, and affect change in, in a better way and more, maybe a more positive culture, both on the field and off the field at the high school level. And I think you, what, sorry, what you asked though about college kids, remind me, you asked about how they're different. Looking at how kids have changed the last 10 years. Yep. Well, and then, COVID and so. Yes. And I definitely didn't want to leave. That's what, that was the first part. I did definitely want the, the last part is the most effective. I, and then outside of that, I don't know. I think our kids here, we just finished exit interviews this week. Our kids here have been the most thankful. And this has been my experience in college when you're upfront and you tell them, Hey, this is what you may struggle with. These are some things you need to work on when you're very, and this is where you're at on the depth chart or whatever it is you're, however it is you're communicating with your players. They just want to be told the truth. I think what they see through is, I think a lot of kids know, hey, I'm probably, a t they can almost do a depth chart on their own. You know, they they know they're not, they, they're at practice every day, probably more so than me and you know, because they're playing basketball, by the way, in the gym for intramurals and they know who the great athletes are. So they know if you're just leading them on and you're, you're not really telling the truth about where they're at. And so our experience has been, and especially in the last week, kids are thankful. They know where they're at. They're just glad that somebody pays attention. We had our first week here when we told someone what they need to work on in practice. We were thanked because the kid said, hey, I just appreciate that you're telling me what I need to work on. No one's done that. And this is at the college level. And so I don't know. I think kids just appreciate you being very genuine. That's my experience today with these kids. They're actually grateful and thankful when you're honest. Most people call it brutal honesty. We're just genuine and are giving them a plan to get better. And I think that's pretty cool. Do you think coaches are fearful of being honest? Yes, I think uh, because it's hard. It's hard. To, it's a hard conversation. It's not fun to tell someone. We, if you ask any of our players today, what's the hardest part of being a coach? And they will one hundred per per to the player will say picking playing time, picking who plays or that. That the alone, we say, hey, it's hard to pick who plays. It's the worst part of the job. The best part is practice every day because we get to work with every kid. And the worst part is then picking who plays. And so I think it's because. You know, we, we could probably have a longer podcast on why, but I think people are scared to have tough conversations and people want to tell things. You don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And if, if, you're, if you're a coach, um, from the sport perspective, so many people think when you're, when you're told you're not good enough, that hurts someone's feelings. Or, you know, and, and people don't want to do that because I think every coach at the, at the root has a heart for kids. That's why, we're do, that's why everybody does is in athletics. And so I think people are scared of that because they're scared to, 
have a kid cry in front of them or they're cared, scared for the kid to then tell their parent. And then the parent calls and says, how can you, how can you um, not think my kid's the best player? You know, we, we verbalize that too, by the way, every parent thinks their kid's the best player on the team. We tell our kids this, it's okay. Like your parents can be mad at me. Your parents can tell you that I'm the worst coach in the world. And that's okay. They love you more than I do. Right. And we can all still be friends. And it's just true. Just like, I love my kids more than I love our players. Like they're second, but the player, you know, my wife first, uh, then my, then kids. And then, and then, um, and then the players. And so we just, again, maybe that's part of the genuine piece, right? If you're just very genuine and tell them, you know, we tell parents the same thing on recruiting business. We talk about those things. So hopefully that helps alleviate the blow. But I do think most coaches are scared of hard conversations. People avoid, I mean, even in your role now, people avoid hard conversations. And so it's easier to sit in your own office and be mad or be frustrated than just to address someone. And I would guess everyone listening to this, however this goes, you can think back every time you have the conversation, you leave thankful you had it. So the same is true for kids in playing time and, and athletics. That makes sense. When I do talk about all this, I I see somebody that's really worked hard on the second dimension of three D to jam. If people listening aren't familiar, there's three dimensions to three dimensional coaching. We really encourage you to check out 3D Institute.com. It's the best stuff out there in my opinion. But the, the first level is the fundamentals teaching the skills, techniques, strategy, all that kind of stuff. If you can't do that, not gonna last as a coach. Second level is really the sports psych, the motivation, goal setting, team building, all those kind of things. And the third level is getting to the heart um, of the athlete and really truly impacting them. So when I hear you talking about this, I hear a lot of second and third dimension kind of stuff. Um, what's been most effective when you look at the second dimension? What what part of that has been most important to you? Let's say this year and talk about some ways you've worked at it. Well, our, our, again, you know, we, we, we educate our kids on everything. And so we talked about, they know here, what's our, if you ask our player to the player, if you ask what's our biggest hurdle as a program, they will say team cohesion. Okay. Football is, football is very, I think, and, and I don't know, I just, I'm not an expert in those sports. So I always say football because it's its own animal. Um, or at least it's my only experience, but football is very unique um, because. But I, I do think inherent human needs in being part of a community is the same. Yeah. The yeah. Process. True. And coaches are community. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and then selfishly, football is my passion or, you know, it's what I do for a living. So um, I will say football has been unique because generally the, not always anyway, more often than not the best team wins, not the most talented team. And I think in football, you see it more. Basketball is unique because on any given night, if a guy gets on fire or is in the zone, he can go for 30. And sometimes there's just, there's very little you can do. They're making contested shots and what are you going to do? You know, so I think there's a, that when I say football is unique and different, I don't, you just don't see that as much in football. Not one player can't change the game as much as a basketball or maybe some other individual sports, which obviously are, are individual based. So anyway, so that's why team cohesion to me has been the biggest, the most important thing is what, it's what we focused on the most since we've been in the college game anyway. But then when you take a new program, it has to go to the focus. So it is team cohesion is the big, the biggest thing for our program and what we focused on so hard. And I think without, without confidence, without level of motivation, um, you, you know, which are all second dimension strategies and emphasis, you, you, you don't have great team cohesion anyway. So uh, it all kind of ties together for me in that team cohesion part. And so, yeah, that's what we've been work, worked really hard on. Um, and again, I think that's the cool part. If you, if you decided, Hey, out of all these things and the 3d strategies in the world, I'm going to focus on team cohesion. Well, the cool part is those are fun things to do. It doesn't matter how good you are at football or at your position, or you don't have to be skilled to be a, a cohesive member of the team and to build this team culture. And so that's been our focus. And, and, and to me, when you focus on that, I think the other second dimension strategies and the other second dimension has been fun. And then you can feel it. I think you can, I can feel it. I don't know if other people on campus can, but you can feel it. It's interesting to think about the progression. If I was in my room once at the end of semester where you told the guys, this is the goal. We sucked at this. Mm -hmm. We need to get better. You know, everybody just specific examples. What is building team cohesion? What did you do? Well, well, specifically, oh man, let me think of the individual because we focused on them so much. But we, what we told the kids, so I think the meeting you're in, we had the cohesion in in, in the fall. It was, it was bad. bad. So, so you know, yeah, we, we, that, that was what we said we had focused on. So we talked, we talked about, about it. it was, it's all these conversations. So, so we all we all went to so some strategy. You had particular cohesion. You do a thing. Um, um, we could call it and fun, fun, but. but we talked to kids about our title, and most coaches say they generations title. Well, well. 
I don't I'm not sorry, sorry, no, no, that's absolutely true. true. It's just, it's just you allow any, any, I mean, I, 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 everybody, everybody feels about value you know, appreciation. So, so anyway, anyway, what we have we focused on when we invest in the program, program number one, right? right? So, so, so if you want, want a big time experience, so one of the things that you're going to some college board is you just want more money to put your name in one of the bigger, better environment. Well, you can't expect people to be, to create that for you if you don't do it for us. So we go to the restaurants who dress like WWE wrestlers, coach camp, and have the shirt on, and they like hang some stuff. And then we were just, we had the rest of the gym, by the way, another good guy, I'm a lady who dressed us up. We were just celebrating those guys, guys one, and gals, one. I'm going to basketball games. Those are some. And then just other things, you know, whatever. Going to invest in other groups. That's what Okay. Then the other part would be, you know, in the track, I can make sure individual conversations being had as like racers, right? Like her position show coach. Or some. And then now, one of them we haven't quite got there yet, but give you kids something to look forward to. You know, we're taking seniors white water wrapping in two weeks, I think, which we showed pictures of that of our previous one on our first. Uh, meeting here, here um, in an area, you know, they ask us something to ask us about. So, so that, that, that the reward knows because I think that you, you, there's just so many second or third things they need to help you do things like that. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah that, that, that's, 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 that's been our focus. focus. And, you know, you know outside, outside of that, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just hey, what we do. I think the last strategy is you do. So we did do individual film in the spring. So normally you would be the offensive line film, film quarterback film. film. We did it in the prior to practice. This is the first time we've ever done that. And we basically went with this book called The Warrior Ethos. And we were talking about what it was you have a warrior spirit. It wasn't going to be the weird. You're breaking that down before practice. So we prioritized this team culture over watching some quarterback film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and, and and when you do that, that, you could hear from the kids. And so we were doing our exit team. They were saying things. That they, that they were hearing, hearing in those, those meetings, meetings, so that that and the degree affected groups. Yeah, that was one of my reflections when I so I spent a decade in college coaching. That was just about a decade. You got out, got into administration. My first year, that was my observation of gosh, I wasted a lot of time on first dimensional stuff that really didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would go back and do some yeah. things that be be that. One, one thing you didn't mention that I thought you would is spotlights and put ups. Talk, Talk about how, how you incorporate that. What they are, yeah, how you incorporate. Them. Yeah, we do. Yeah, sorry, we, we do that at every. So that's just a year round thing. I, mean, I was trying to think of what was different in spring. But yeah, yeah we, we do. So, so at the end of every, every practice, every lift, every game, we do, we do put ups. And so, um, again, that's part of it. They mentioned that as a strategy on ingredients.com. If you go to that certification process, but but that's one. I think that came from Frosty West. Mr. has been a guy I'm sorry, I always enjoyed it. Big time where you're at. Big time for studying him. So it just doesn't end in practice. We, we, this is, we do do a one on off player. You have to, you have to stand up, look at the team in the eye, and put up on the show. You know, we get to the agenda. You know, society is just a full of opportunities to put people down, right? And put people down, be negative, make fun of others. And we don't know what the over does. I want to be a friend and build each other up. The Bible says the town has a little bit of a story. We want to be older than men. And so, we have to be intentional just to say, you know, an example of. Prefer the off the field thing. Sometimes, Sometimes off the field, field creeps in there. You know, we're not that diligent about it. Um, but then you have to have a, you know, you have, you have to do a silly cheer and we all do it together. And, and you, know, you know, if you come watch our tracks, I think that shut up people in Moses because they'll do the silliest cheerers. Um, but, you know, we talked about this this morning. Everybody does it. So, though, everybody does it. It's fun. And, and, and parents always have a big comment about that when they visit. But we do that. Um, some spotlight is when we got done. We did get more in the fall. We could probably do it more. The spotlight drill just a little bit. And so, spotlight is an opportunity to, you know, you can you stand up and you pick one player, look them in the eye. They stand up and you you know you you spotlight them. And say, hey, off the field, um, what are some things they've done um, that you want to spotlight and highlight? And then you get you get dead time and you allow anyone else to stand up and do that. Put ups to me, maybe it's just we we always talk about doing both. We do way more put ups because it's a little bit faster. It's just who we are. Spotlight just has a little more of a heavy, in my opinion, has a little heavier feel. And there, there's a place for it. It's just we. On the field after practice, we just focus on gaps. I think they can be one and the same in a lot of ways. Oh, hey, it's, 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 it's finding someone else and telling them good things about them and lifting them up. Who cares what you call it? And I, I found, even in my role now, um, you got to force people to affirm others at times. And like we do spotlights at every department meeting. People roll their eyes about it until they get spotlighted. Yeah. And the toughest dude is still choked up when they hear their peers affirm them as a person, not just, hey, man, you're a good football coach, way to go. Well, it's, it's countercultural, right? We just, we already, even for people our age, it's countercultural to pick somebody up as opposed to tear them down or at least acknowledge someone good at something because it's, that makes me look, it makes me look like I'm less than, right? So that's countercultural. And, and then, like you mentioned, most athletes are 
Uh, maybe this is just me, but I assume most athletes, but like me, I'm not good. I don't like, I'm not good at getting put up or spotlight or complimented. I'm very bad at that. I don't, I don't enjoy compliments very well. Yeah, and so totally. it's good that also a skill to learn because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay for, it's good to hear people appreciate, you know, mm-hmm. because everyone in the world feels underappreciated anyway. So, yeah, we used to do something I like. So I, this 3D journey started about the same time. I think it, you might have beat me by a year, but, um, I was just captured by because I've been searching for that way of how do you create a positive kind of affirming culture. And Simon Sinek wrote about a company, I can't remember what book, um, that we sold for a while. It was this major, I guess, an engineering company where peers could nominate somebody for, it was like the Do Good Award or something like that. We called it the Goodness Award when we did it. Um, but peers nominated. And then whoever won, they had like this whole company meeting. And Simon, if you're listening, call me. If I'm getting this wrong, you're welcome on the show. Uh, but they invited the person that got the awards family, and they would sit there and read everything their peers said about them. And their whole family could hear all the positive affirmation. And then they also gave them the keys to the company Porsche for like a six months or something like that. Stay night for the company, the French University Porsche. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> we did have the cheapest t-shirt I could find and it said, I do good or something like that. Yeah. But anyways, another, another version of what that could look like. And, um, yeah, every time you do it, when you, you, you just see tears and you see just a level of appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. That's a kind of culture. I think that's why anything yeah. like that, that's why it looks impactful because you don't, that's not normal. Yeah. Not unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So one more topic, um, talk about toughness. And grit. I hear you use those words a lot. What does that mean and how do you develop it? Yeah. Well, it's that's the toughness, you know, it's it's it, what does it mean? That's a great question. You know, I can tell you for us, right? This idea of mental toughness and creating tough people. Um, I think it's something that I think men need young men need that and crave that. And I think maybe there's a push against talking about toughness as much. Um, but we talk about it every day and it and it's one of those deals. Um, for us, when you, when you put the name Jesus on your program and for us as an institution, uh, we are a Christian institution. Um, now we, the cool part is friends is a place for everybody. And, and we'd be crazy not to acknowledge that we have everyone from likely and atheist, agnostic, whatever those terms would mean all the way to, we actually have a couple of kids on our, our team that are faith formation ministry majors, but we have everything in between. And I've been everything in between for, so it's, it's a welcoming place, right? But certainly for me, I take it very seriously that, you know, we are a Christian institution. And so most of the time when people hear that, they associate that with softness, um, scared of confrontation, and a little bit of a more reserved personality. Well, in my opinion, and at least my personality, is, it, it actually means the polar opposite. And when you do that, it requires excellence. And excellence to me in football requires toughness. Um, it's a tough game for tough people. Football hurts. It's violent. Um and there's, you know, there's a reason why most people use the word grind. We don't use the word grind, but there's a reason why that exists because we think, or at least in my estimation, it's because it requires toughness to do it every day. Mm-hmm. All right. And then the level of toughness of we have ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, six at some positions. Every one of those positions requires a different level of toughness because it's, there's just a different, it's, there's a different level of adversity for each one of those, those depth parts of the depth chart. So how we address those, number one, we confront it and we say it out loud, right? And we talk about, hey, you're not selfish or you're, if you want to be an All-American, that's not selfish. Or if you want to play more, it doesn't mean that you lack mental toughness, all right? Uh, so we acknowledge that, but we do acknowledge also what it, what it requires for you to take those next steps. So some of that already ties back to the genuine stuff we talked about and being very upfront and honest. Um, it takes some strategy on our part, being intentional about practice. Everybody gets an opportunity to practice. Yeah, I think that connects to, again, I'll bring up Tim Elmore. I, pretty big fan, obviously. Yeah. Um, but he said something in order with the Generation Z. So it, people born around 2000 and later, you have to start with empathy to get to grit. And I quite, I'm sure people have different definitions. I see it as one of the same. Yeah. Um, it's kind of what I'm hearing you say is start with empathy of, I understand where you're at mm-hmm. and that can get to grit just saying it out loud. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's probably better put, yeah, obviously better put than I can do. That's why he writes books, but absolutely, you know, and I think so when you acknowledge those things, and then for us, it's giving ourselves the opportunity to be tough. So everyone thinks I'm crazy. So my during my career in college, I have tried to play the best teams in the country. Now it's not always worked out with scheduling or whatever, but we have taken on challenges of people that people perceive as better than us only because it's just given our kids an opportunity to 
you know, to, to develop mental toughness. And we know on the, if we can do it against the highest level of competition and seek out this whole idea of anybody, anywhere, anytime, whatever those A's are, um, and if we can do that, we're going to be better for it. We're going to be tougher for it. And so, um, I think that's developed a ton of toughness. And, um, I think it's, it's no, no different than I think, I think a level of our toughness as well comes from the ritualization of our programs. So we just have these rituals and we acknowledge it and we, so we embrace hard things. We embrace hard games. We embrace talented teams. Like, I just don't enjoy winning 60 to zero while it's cool. And it's good for, I guess it's good for people. I would wait. It's way more fun to be down by a touchdown with two minutes left and have the ball, right? Or whatever. That's just fun. And it's exhilarating and you get chill bumps, right? Well, now when you coach long enough, and for me, that's what we're looking for. That we're looking for that playoff games, hard opponents where no one thinks you're going to win. I can close my eyes and I can see it. So that's been challenged to our players. Can you close your eyes and see it? You, you know, arm in arm, you know, lock in, playing a team that everyone thinks is going to beat us, that we're picked to lose by 100, um, and you're excited and ready to go, you know, eyes wide open, chill up, ready to roll and go get it on in bad weather. I can do that. And so we're trying to get our players to do that. You know, and I think they they have embraced that mindset, which requires toughness, right? Because, again, when the day comes that we're in a playoff game here, and it will come, um, we're going to get big to lose, and we're going to be on the road, and it's likely going to be in Northern State where it's snowing. Here we go. That's well, that's when we play our best football because we're the toughest team in America. And that's the idea. That's the mindset we go with every day. So, you know, those are ways we do it. Um, and so what about building toughness with staff? Is you have a lot of young GAs, young staff. We talked earlier about people are scared of the hard conversation. Have you put any thought of what it looks like to develop that? It's, it's just no I, as far as thought, no, because it's just how we operate every day. We just give me feedback. It's just really funny to be on our staff. You have to be a tough person because we we're just very honest. If, if when we're bad at something on the turf, we tell them and we tell them to fix it. The kids hear it. They say, yes, sir. And we fix it. Or yes, coach, because I'm not that big of a power trip. It's just an idea. Yes, I'm going to fix that. Um, so I think that's how it starts with the staff. And then we do get feedback on everything, whether that's listening to a recruiting conversation they have with a parent, um, watching their, we do film their individual work, work so we can see that. Um, or, you know, even, and it can be as simple as hearing something said off the cuff. It's like, that has to be addressed. And so what we do, um, we confront all of those things, but uh, our pastor, I heard him say it one time, all frustration comes from unmet expectation. So our focus this spring has been the power of expectations. So what, what can the staff expect from me? What can the players expect from staff? What can, you know, and, and what can players expect from other players? There's so much power in saying, what are the expectations here? And that's been part of our, uh, this, the meetings we talked about, this team cohesion yeah. meetings we've had. It's this idea of the power of expectations. And it was just, rem- I was just reminded of that this spring, honestly. It was just, hey, man, it's so true when you hear that. And so I think everybody's coaching career, you do better at other times. And so what we just were very clear about is the power of expectations for all p- people in our program, coaches, players, parents, whatever that's going to be. And so when you communicate it, man, that, and there's a, there's a, there's an element of, um, I don't know, you, you kind of invigorate people, you give them power because now they know mm-hmm. if I just do this, then I've met every standard. And for us, when we talk about toughness, what is it, what does toughness look like when you walk out this meeting? What does toughness look like when you're in class on campus? And so we do that for everything. Gratitude. What does it look like to honor God? What does that mean when you walk out as opposed to there's a lot of coaches that make awesome PowerPoints and I'm not knocking them and they do a great job of that. But maybe when you walk out the door, what does that look like on a, you know, day-to-day individual basis? And I think that's where people fall short. Read a book, make a PowerPoint. Well, it's very different when you're just interacting daily. And I think that's our strength as opposed to maybe the organizational meeting part. Mm-hmm. And that's been a aha moment for me of when I look at in my career as an AD, when it's gone bad with coaches, a lot of times it was doomed from the start because there wasn't clarity of definition, and expectation of here's what I mean by that. So I spent the last six months after some stuff trying to redefine and create total clarity in the interview process. And I hear that's what what you're saying too, because yeah. everybody can put their own spin on it and given to their own devices, we're going to do what we want instead of thinking about the group. Right. Yeah. Power of expectation, I think very uh, underappreciated, you know, out there. I think that's what's been very cool. And that's been for me, like you just mentioned in the last three or four months, that's kind of what my focus has been on. So then I hope in the fall when we meet everybody and new players and we're all together as a new team, the expectations are clear from day one, as opposed to, you know, 
feeling like the ebbs and flows of coaching. Yeah, I'm a conversation for another day too. It'd be interesting to dive deep on, okay, when you take over a program as opposed to when you're a couple of years in, when you have less buy-in, when you have more buy-in. Mm-hmm. So it takes some serious courage and when you just start and don't have a lot of buy-in. What does that look like? Yeah, and you have to enjoy that part. I actually yeah. enjoy that part and you have to enjoy hard conversation. I think that would be a thing. So be very selective about, mm-hmm. you know, you got to know what you're getting into, yeah. you know, and I think, I know, I remember back, we knew, I was like, hey, this is going to be real hard, you know, mm-hmm. like, yes, it is. And so you've had to remind me of that a couple of times. <laughs> I remember me saying, I've been living the hard for years. <laughs> You know, man, let's go. All right. Last part. You cannot spend more than 20 seconds answering any of these questions. And then we'll, we'll wrap up. So first question, what's one thing that we haven't covered that we should have? Man, you know, only the only thing I would say is that probably very, um, our kids are awesome kids here. And I think that they're not necessarily special. So I think every kid out there has that in them. And so I think if you're struggling with any of these issues or team culture issues or team cohesion issues, likely it can be fixed and likely immediately. What's one book you've read that if you could gift it to all our listeners, what would you gift them? Uh, the, the Messiah Method. That's been, that's been a big component of our program. I, I, I shared that with all the um, kids in this class I'm teaching right now. Yeah, good stuff. How has failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure? Favorite failure? I feel like I fail every day. So I don't, you know, I don't know. Favorite failure? Answer the question. Come on, man. I don't, I really, I can't think of a specific failure, but I do appreciate, I appreciate hard times a lot. And I embrace nice. those because I know it's made us better, tougher, all that good stuff. So I, I can't think of a specific one, but plenty. What's one weird habit or absurd thing that you do that you think makes you better? I don't, I don't have, a weird, I, don't, I don't know. I, I would need help with that weird habit that makes me better. Um, I don't know. I think that, I think we have a staff full of this, by the way. I'm, I'm very reflective and I'm, I think I'm very good at hard feedback. Now, so I don't know if that's a weird habit, but I do know I enjoy hard feedback and I enjoy pe- people telling me what I'm bad at. And talk about weirdness. If I get b- bad emails from parents, don't bother me. Bad feedback from fans of the game, don't bother me. I actually embrace that stuff because sometimes there's generally a nugget of truth and wisdom in there. And so I'm not a grudge holder against parents that tell me maybe we've fallen short. So that's kind of weird, I think. My last one in the last five years, what new belief, behavior have that has most improved your life? Um, belief, behavior, habits is most improved my life. Um, I think, you know, more than anything, just the, just believing that, um, what we, that we can truly change like, or, you know, locally specifically, but even the world through mentoring these guys. And I think there's a craving out there for this idea of a, what does a tough Christian man look like? And so I think maybe early on in my career, I didn't necessarily know if I believe that to the core. But now that I, I, I mean, I see that every day. And so it's just reaffirming that we're doing the right thing here. And so I think in the last five years of anything, that's been, that's been life changing for me to know that there's a craving for it. And I told you this just the other day, when parents, when parents sit in our office, they want toughness for their young men. They want to, we talk a lot about what does a Christian man look like and a tough guy look like. There is a craving for that out there. And so our mission is to get out there and go find those kids and families that want that. I like her hammock or ADC said the coach will impact people in a year of them. What is it? Anybody else living a lifetime? Yeah. Don't, you never, I think they don't illustrate the power of a coach. Right. And I, I'm the, I'm the same way, a silly football coach, but also that's, that's almost, I probably shouldn't say that as much because kind of, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do enough justice for what, what coaches can do every day. So, no, appreciate it, man. Cool. Good conversation. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of Beyond Coaching. Beyond Coaching is a podcast developed and produced by the Impactful Coaching Project with the support of Friends University. The Impactful Coaching Project seeks to develop coaches that coach the whole person and is the thought leader in coaching the 21st century athlete. The Impactful Coaching Project produces training, information, and research to help coaches improve. To see more information, Go to impactfulcoachingproject.substack.com. Thank you.